Hi, everybody. Father Bill Holtzinger here from Holy Trinity Catholic Church. I'm here with Snickers. Yeah, and he's kind of rearing to uh, start barking at a dog that goes by. I'm at the parish house in the office. Uh, I'm here because, and I'm also using this setup because uh, outside there was somebody who was using a... Um, um, like a lawnmower or generator, and it was constantly coming through the iPhone. Usually I use an iPhone, and yeah, that's what you hear in the background. So this microphone actually isolates it well. This is my podcast setup, and oh my gosh, is he going to go sit down? Oh, thank goodness. Okay, he's now sitting down. Very good. Let's see how far we can get. So anyhow, I want to uh, let you know that that's why I'm here uh, in this particular particular place. I might do more other, other uh, episodes here uh, in the future, um, but with the dog and the issues with uh, what walks around in the front of the house in the street it could be an issue. Today, I want to talk for our Friday reflection about faith and science. Faith and science often are considered things that are diametrically opposed to each other. That's kind of the, the, the understanding of our, our uh, culture, and that's kind of the dogma of our day. But I'd like to tell you that actually I would, I'd like to offer a different narrative, and that is that science and faith are particularly harmonized together. In fact, Catholicism as a tradition of Christianity is very particularly in harmony with science. Why would I say that? Well, I'll get to that in a second. I want to give you a couple books to read, and I recommend, because I'm not going to get to everything. This is basically going to be a a big picture thing. Uh, But if you want to read more, you can go to these books. And I'm reading on my screen here uh, these four books I recommend. One is How the Catholic Church Built Western Civilization by Thomas E. Woods, Jr. And Galileo Goes to Jail and Other Myths About Science and Religion, which is edited by Ronald Numbers. One that's a little difficult to get a hold of, and if you can get this one, great. It's called Heaven's Proclaim, Astronomy and the Vatican. This is a production or a publication of the Vatican Observatory, and it's I think it's out of print, but nonetheless. Here's one that is in print from the Vatican Observatory. It's, in, it's called Would You Baptize an Alien? And Other Questions from Astronomers Inbox at the Vatican Observatory. And that is from Brother Guy Casamagno and Paul Mueller, both Jesuits. So take a look at those books. If you're looking for something to read about, that's what I'd recommend. Bottom line, science and faith have the same teleological end. In other words, they have the same goal in mind, which is the truth. They come at it from different points of view, and they come from, with different skill sets, but their goal is to find the truth. Theology is trying to understand the truth about God. Science, specifically like physics and astrophysics, things like that, are trying to determine how God made things. So one is what, who made it, right? And the other one is what is it he made? But this conflict of science or proposed conflict between science and faith really came to the fore in the uh, 1800s and the 1900s. And I want to point you in the direction of two people in specific, Andrew Dixon White and John William Draper. And again, you can read about these guys in the uh, book, the Galileo Goes to Jail book. But basically, they're making the argument that the church has attacked science, that church is actually anti-science. That's kind of what we hear today, right? Well... I'd encourage you to, if you want to, uh, take a look at this text. You can even read their own uh, their own books. And they get a lot of history wrong is the problem. And there's quite a bias there. Now, um, interesting about Andrew Dixon White, he the, uh, was the president of Cornell University. And he desired that he would create a, he calls it a, an asylum for science, where there's no bias by religion, right? Because again, there's a negative sense about religion. And they've gone on talks, both of these gentlemen have gone on talks and and made these arguments. But it's strange because um, as you'll hear in part two uh, of this uh, podcast or my uh, Friday reflection, I should say, there's always been a a dance, right? There's always been a dialogue between faith and science. But if you go back in the church, back in history, uh, science actually is a, a new term. We'd probably call it let's say, just go 200 years or more, something more the kind of what we call natural philosophy. So if, you use the word, if I use the words natural philosophy, or you read about it by individuals like Augustine or Aquinas, you'll find that that's what they're talking about. So, anyhow, 
again, please read about those gentlemen. And it's curious because as they, they make the argument that the church thinks that the world is flat. Okay, the problem with that, of course, is that we have plenty of examples. For example, St. Venerable Bede, years are 673 to 735, who taught the world was round. Or Hildegard of Bingham, she's 1098 to 1179, did the same. Thomas Aquinas did the same. And even there was a book called The Sphere. The Sphere was a title of the most popular medieval book of, on astronomy, written in English uh, and from a Catholic scholastic. Basically, it informed uh, us that not only the Earth, but all heavenly body, bodies are spherical. So this idea is kind of bogus. Okay, so let's, I want to draw you to, to one of the most powerful fathers of the church that both Catholics and Protestants always lean on, and that is St. Augustine, St. Augustine of Hippo. He, of course, is the father of the church. He's a bishop. He's a theologian. But he said this. He said that the Bible and natural philosophy, remember I talked about that, right? Natural philosophy, natural philosophy or science do not contradict each other. He wrote this in his document or his text, The Literary Commentary of Genesis. Because think about it, Genesis, this is where we always go to when we want to say, look at that. The church believes in a six-day creation, and yet we can see in astronomy that it is billions of year, you know, years old. How can this be? And it takes so, many, you know, so much time to actually create the world that we see as we know it. Well, just remember that the, the Genesis accounts, there's two of them, and they're different. And actually, that's a whole genre of really poetry, not intended to be a scientific endeavor. So... That's the first thing. And so when we read the scriptures, St. Augustine tells us, if we see a contradiction there, then that means we've got something wrong about one or the other, or maybe both. Not to be outdone, but to be clarified, is St. Thomas Aquinas. St. Thomas Aquinas said something basically like this, they are complementary. Faith and reason are complementary. Or if In fact, there's, if there's any apparent contradictions in science, remember natural philosophy, or religion, that indicates there's an error in one person's understanding of one or the other, or maybe again both. So they have to help each other. Basically, science helps religion or, or faith from being superstitious. And faith also is a guard against animism or physicalism or scientism, which is uh, you know the belief that science is a religion in and of itself. We have also people like Pope Pius XII who made it clear that science is a good thing to be done in his Humani Generis document he wrote. We have other people like St. John Paul II who gave messages to the Pontifical Academies on several occasions who spoke about science to them. Uh, same thing with actually Pope Francis. In fact, I want to quote Pope Francis, if you don't mind. He said this in his address to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. He said that, he ca well, first of all, he cautioned us from having images of God as a magician or as someone with a magic wand. Uh, you know, there's some atheist uh, evangelists, you might say, which is kind of a, maybe a contradiction, but uh, they'll speak about how God is a floating spaghetti monster in space. Like, no, 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 no. That's not even what we believe. He goes on to say, so we got to be cautioned, cautious about calling or considering God a magician with like a magic wand, arguing, arguing that belief in both theories around the beginnings of the universe and the birth of mankind are consistent with the Catholic faith. Again, we're talking about the origins, the cosmology that we have um, of how humans came to be and, and what our faith tells us. He goes on to say the Big Bang, again, that's cosmology, which is today posited as the origin of the world, does not contradict divine act, the divine act of creation. Rather, it requires it. Similarly, he argued, evolution of nature is not inconsistent with the notion of creation because evolution presupposes the creation of beings which evolve. Now, there's a gentleman named Rodney Stark, and he wrote a, a text, um, I, mean, actually, I think it was in an article in American Enterprise, that's what it was, yeah, and it's called False Conflict. Christianity is not only compatible with science, it created it. This is what he said. And by the way, he's a professor of sociology at the University of Washington. The rise of science was not an extension of classical learning. It was the natural outgrowth of Christian doctrine. Nature exists because it was created by God in order to love God and honor God. 
it is necessary to fully appreciate the wonders of his handiwork. Moreover, because God is perfect, his handiwork functions in accord with immutable principles. By the full use of our God-given powers of reason and observation, it ought to be possible to discover these principles. These crucial religious ideas were why the rise of science occurred in Christian Europe and not somewhere else. Hmm. That's a 2003 uh, article he wrote. And see, the problem is a lot of people in history have believed in animism, things like uh, rocks had a tendency to fall. That's what they do. It's not because of any science. They would give like a an anthropological or anthropomorphism to them that they rocks want to fall. Um, Greeks did this. Greeks assigned conscious purposes to material actors in the cosmos all the time. Father uh, Stanley Yaki, another a Benedictine, he's got to rest his soul. He wrote a uh, book called The Origin of Science and the Science of Origins in 1970. He also stated something similar. He said, only Christians believe that, quote, the universe was the rational product of the creator and that as Christians they had to become masters and possess and possessors of nature. That the world could then be comprehended by the mind is a religious statement. Really, uh, it didn't have to be, right? It's a miracle that it is comprehensible. But we believe, as has been revealed to us, that God has created all things and has numbered them and ordered them so that we could comprehend them and they would make sense. And in fact, we hear like in things like Psalm 19, uh, 19 2, the heavens proclaim the glory of God, right? And that means that God is the creator of all things and all of creation is subject to his power. In Wisdom 11 and 20, we read this. But you have disposed all things by measure and number and weight. Hmm. So what is modern science, right? So modern science is using what's called the scientific method, right? So that, me that method is something like this, right? Observation, analysis, hypothesis building, testing that hypothesis, and then coming to a theory. Or just observation, experiments, testing of a hypothesis. And this goes over and over. In fact, if anything, science is known for its changes and changes. Uh, like right now, we have the Big Bang Theory, right? That's the theory of the origin of the universe. Before that, it was a steady state theory. And who knows what we'll know 100 years from now, what new discoveries will be made. And that means we have to adjust our, our physics or our astronomy. In fact, the James Webb Hub Telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope, <laughs> not the Hubble Telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope, has caused all kinds of questions and re-looks re at things, and a lot of things going to change because of that, which is great, right? But as I mentioned, it's not the, uh, it's not the, um, the outgrowth of natural uh, thinking. I mean, it's not that it's not illogical, but classical thinking, people like, uh, that did metaphysics and poetry, like, let's say, Aristotle, right? And his dates are around 300 uh, B.C. He actually taught that, again, kind of animism. There's, like, rocks are they have a, a rationality. They, they tend to do these things. This is what they do, uh, as if they are almost thinking. And, of course, we also struggled with the idea of where we are in the universe. Like, for example, it seems reasonable, but by only classical thinking, that everything revolves around us, right? Because we're not moving that we can tell, right? And so they couldn't know science back then in Aristotle's day. So it would look like the sun moved around us and the stars did and all the planets did. Uh, but we know because of other observation and science that that is not the case, that actually there's something more than, than just that. That with the advent of telescopes and other technology, we've been able to... Uh, actually not just know this, the world is round, but actually be able to measure how round, how big we are, and also those things out in the, in the sky, we've been able to determine how far they are using something called parallax, which is math, using geometry uh, and trigonometry. And that means those are not just in the dome of the sky like we might have thought, which was part of natural reasoning, right? They seem to be up there. They don't move except for the planets which plants means wanderer. And so it's because of our ability to then know that the, the world is knowable and intelligible 
that we can then do our science. Because what happens if it was always changing? The scientific method wouldn't work because it would, it would just work one time, but the next time it wouldn't work. And when we do that now, we'd say, well, that's not, that's not then the case. We have to wait till it can be repeated. That well, Not only is it a, an experiment done, other people have to be able to repeat it for it to be considered a viable theory. And then we move on, and other theories may come in and make it better or change it or completely show that there's something even more dramatic. I think Einstein uh, was able to do that in a pretty heavy way. So I'm going to leave you with those thoughts. I mean, next time I get together with you, I want to let you know that we'll be, I'll be talking about the people that are the scientists or people that were involved in natural philosophy who are Catholic and how Catholics have been really the forerunners of, mar of modern science. There's lots of people in the, at the beginnings of modern science, and even still today, who are people of faith, uh, Christian faith, Muslim faith, Jewish faith, and all these people, we agree it as kind of the language of how we do science. And I'd like to say that we can thank the Catholic Church for that. You can read those books and you'll understand more if you want. In the meantime, I'm going to sign off here and just let you know uh, that uh, this weekend... I look forward to seeing you. I'm not going to talk about science, but we're going to continue with the Gospel of Matthew and Jesus' discussion about uh, what they call the antitheses, where he talks about, you know, you've heard this said, the Mosaic Law, but I tell you this, right? And he goes through many of them. We did this last week. I didn't read them all, but we'll conclude with the rest of them this week. And I want to encourage you to read ahead because Jesus doesn't abolish the law at all. He fulfills it. He is the actual fulfillment of the law in himself. So if you're able to come, I hope you can. Uh, remember, we are a family, and if you know somebody who's not able to make it or is struggling to think about whether they're going to come or not, I want to encourage you to invite them to come with you so that we can be together more as a family. This weekend, uh, on actually tomorrow when you see this, uh, this is Friday, right? So I'm actually recording this on Tuesday, but you'll see it on Friday. Um, will be our confirmation mass at 10 o'clock on Saturday. And we'll have Bishop Peter Smith with us. And we have some around 127 people getting confirmed. It's going to be packed. And so if you're not able to make it, I, I would ask that you pray for our young people and our adults who are getting confirmed and uh, us who will be kind of managing that. And, of course, Bishop Peter, uh, that he would have he'll be received well and that his preaching would be good and, and people's hearts would be encouraged uh, through the process of the Mass and, and their hearts would be uh, laid open and ready to receive the Holy Spirit in confirmation. And until next time, God bless you, and I'll see you later. Bye-bye. As like last time, there's one more thing, and I goofed up this as well. I wanted to also share with you, because this actually uh, started with... Uh, a video from Robert Barron's Word on Fire Institute on Faith and Science. And I want to put up a link uh, as I end this video so that you can uh, check that out. Uh, right now, as I recorded this, there is two different um, programs, and they're not long. Um, they're like 15 minutes each. The first one's called uh, Light from Light, and the other one is God and Nature. And this is what they're calling their Wonder Series. I think they have six of them coming, something like that. That is really well done, and I want to encourage you to uh, watch those videos. And again, I'll put the links in the, the show notes, but also hopefully on the screen here. God bless you all. Bye-bye. And see you later. <laughs>